Good day to everybody. Well, hello everybody. I think that uh, we can uh, we can uh, begin our uh, session today. And uh, today uh, we are going to discuss with uh, Berna uh, about uh, about the primary of space in politics, bargaining, rights, and freedom. And uh, I think that uh, Berna can have a small uh, introduction. And uh, after we can accept uh, um, questions or uh, comments about that. In the meanwhile, I see that Yuri uh, has just uh, joined us. So if uh, Yuri would like to say hello to everybody. Hi, can you hear me now? We can hear you, but Yuri cannot. Uh, have, I mean, Yuri does oh, okay, step so uh, now. I should respond to him by writing. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. I think we can begin. So you have the floor, uh, Berna. You you can begin with a small introduction of your uh, of your article, and after we can uh, uh, begin our exchange, uh, exchange idea exchange. Okay, so um, the floor is mine, and I start talking, discussing um, my article now. Yes, yes. Just ten minutes, just to frame uh, the discussion. Okay, um, you mentioned 10 minutes yesterday. Is it going to be, should it be shorter? How, how long would you like me to introduce it? Well, uh, 10 minutes is fine. If you feel that the five is enough, it's uh, basically up to you. More okay. time uh, you speak, less the other people have to interact. So you judge how much you need to, for framing the subject today. Okay. Um, let me highlight a couple of things. I'm not going to summarize the article. Let me highlight the uh, uh, points from the article and then um, probably situate it into the larger debate, but I won't take more than 10 minutes. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, um, hello, everybody. As you may have noted, noticed in my IDER article, my work is focused on the intimate affinities between politics of urban space, power struggles, and democratization. Rather than the popular trend of focusing on the protests, however, I'm interested in the interplay between the city and the government, or the state, as it unfolds in everyday life. My ethnography digs into the mundane daily life, particularly the politics of everyday life, politics of lifestyle, sorry. The bulk of the literature in urban studies, as you all know, focuses most often on either social problems, such as poverty and crime, or issues related to gentrification, neoliberalism, and, all, and um, global capitalism. From these perspectives, cities are often regarded negatively as a menace of modernity, inequality, or and or as an effect of class um, as an effect of injustices. Clearly, this trend of pathologizing the city originates from um, a Marxist understanding of the structure and the habit of indexing politics primarily to the relations of production, socioeconomic relations in capitalism. However, one of the slogans um, in the famous Gezi protests in Turkey, um, which took place in 2013, was important to notice uh, as it challenged the predominant socioeconomic reductionism in the field. So one of these slogans that we all know um, was ev kira ama bizim, meaning the apartment is a rental, but the neighborhood belongs to us. The Iger article was part of a larger ethnographic book, which is forthcoming uh, from um, Univer Stanford University Press um, by the end of next month, March 2015. And my ethnography conducted in highly contested urban sites, including Teshvike, which you read about, makes two major arguments. First. The city is remarkably vulnerable to conflict and divides within the state apparatus, um, particularly polarization between and within the branches of the state concurs with splits in the city. Uh, and Istanbul stands out in this regard um, currently. Second, contested urban space is most capable of generating democratic alliances especially when there is little or no contestation within the parliament under an over-empowered government. 
Um, so urban alliances born out of conflict are likely to propel democratization, I argue. And um, again, no need to repeat, um, probably you all know that the justice and development government in Turkey right now stands out in this regard. So in the midst of secularist backlash in 2007, my first finding was um, simple, but an eye opener. While searching for clash between pious Muslims and secularist actors on the streets, to my surprise, I found myself in the middle of deep conflict and antagonism among the secular urbanites. They were disagreeing on and contesting whether and in which ways Muslim ways of life were to be accommodated. These contested sites became deeply divided as they opened up their doors, which had previously seemed invincible. Unsurprisingly, not every contested urban site was capable of accommodating newcomers. After conducting ethnography in several contested sites of Istanbul that became divided after the inclusion of pious Muslims, I moved my fieldwork to the famous Turkish neighborhood of Germany, Kreuzberg in Berlin. I was curious to find out how pervasive fault lines were spatially and um, politically uh, moving outside of Turkey. And if, they're, if they were actually uh, moving outside of Turkey. But differently, my goal in this international move was to explore how far urban divides in political um, contestation um, could be traced from local neighborhood to national and international scale. Due to time constraints, let me um, share a couple of highlights from my research on the politics of neighborhood in Teşvikiye, which you read. Um, instead of talking about other sites of my research. With larger political and economic transitions, Istanbul first became a segregated city um, in the 1990s, segregated between Muslim and secularist neighborhoods. And then it became slowly mixed through deep contestation and chaos in the new millennium. When I was doing research for my forthcoming uh, book between 2007 and 2013, this exclusively secularist um, neighborhood of Teşvikiye looked much different. It changed fast. As the pious Muslims entered both to the polity, um, that is the state, um, and to the urban space, head-scarved high spenders transgressed unspoken fences in the city and entered spaces designated previously as um, secular. The transgression was performed not only by high spending consumers in Teşvikiye, but also by overarching students at some competitive universities, for example, and by successful businessmen in a very competitive market. Uh, all these people acquired new bourgeois tastes and ways of life. These unforeseen and non-deliberate entrances um, of the pious were dividing the secular residents. I do not wish to summarize the article that you already read, uh, but perhaps I will conclude by highlighting um, a few major points for further discussion, and then I, I will stop. Um, first, none of the pious newcomers I interviewed were organizing in neighborhood networks and or doing community activism. Put differently, the emergent bonds and alliances for inclusion did not originate in associational life or through collective mobilization. To the contrary, loose everyday life relations and um, sporadic interaction predominated in the neighborhood. This was really different from political engagements of civil society. The influence of these new middle class secular residents was simply in their accepting lifestyle and democratic practices. Second, the contested urban sites that I referred as the zones of freedom, such as Teşvikiye, have increasingly become the hotbed for international connections. Um, ethnic minority groups, such as the influential Jewish community and the high-end Armenian jewelers, provided intimate links to other metropolitans of the world. Third, what we see in the transition of Teşvikiye is the rise of a new inhabitant, inhabitant in a, a new kind of urbanism that is capable of rising above the ideological and identitarian device in the name of freedoms and rights. And actually, much later, after I was done with this ethnography, 
This became very clear when the Gezi protests erupted in 2013. Um, I see Gezi um, as entirely above ideological divides. It was an alliance of people who cared for freedoms and rights. So this urban inhabitant is mostly younger, highly educated, middle class, and mostly, and most importantly, non-ideological. For a long time, most of us mistook the um, misunderstood these non-ideological stand of the young population as, as um, an apolitical um, stand uh, worldview. But to the contrary, the new inhabitant of Istanbul is a freedom seeker and disagrees with many forms of exclusion, discrimination, and authoritarian interventions to ways of life. Fourth and finally, my last point that I'm going to highlight today, common wisdom sees urban disarray and disorder in divided cities as a threat to social order, national security, and political stability. Deep political fault lines in cities are often regarded as potentially capable of dividing and dragging societies into violence or civil war. In contrast, I argue that the process of democratization, especially in the Middle East, is not the reduction of conflict but rather the capacity to form new alliances, most often on the streets and in the urban space, alliances that come out of conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. Thanks to you, Bernard. Uh, now, uh, our first question for today, or comment, uh, we still don't know, and it's uh, from uh, Oliver. <coughs> Oliver uh, Roy uh, Bala, uh, Bayerdon. And uh, he has posted, he's going to write uh, on it, uh, his question on the, on the uh, right side. And uh, this is, uh, and this is uh, uh, what we do normally is that the author can read. The, the, the question. In this case, it's quite long, so we need some uh, for reading it. And uh, in order to keep uh, the audio file consistent afterwards. Uh, Berna, can you do that? Um, Giovanni, um, I lost your voice for two seconds. Are you asking me to read um, Oliver's paragraph, which starts with thank you? Yes, thank you. And okay, after, just... once you read it, you can begin uh, answering to it. Okay, perfect. Just give me one second. I'm going to read it immediately. Thank you. And uh, you need to read aloud. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I'm just learning. So Sorry. that everybody can listen to it and that we can record it. Okay, perfect. So um, this last paragraph, um, which is before Yuri's response, that's what I'm reading. Yes. Thank you for the great piece. That one. Thank you. It, re um, it read like a novel, but it was frustrating because you kept answering my questions as they were arising in my head. Smiley face. <laughs> you really deserved, um, oh, thank you. You really deserved the award um, Iger granted, for, granted you for it. Thank you very much, Olur. <laughs> now my question, and excuse me if it's too far away from your pious and secular neighborhood residents. I wonder how street level station can constitute a, a um, gateway and not a barrier to political reform and democratization, page 411. In the face of what happens from what appears from here at least as an increasingly authoritarian and conservative president with an agenda for the Islamization of a hitherto secular country. And I would like to hear your comment. You, I, I would like to hear your comment on that, both as a native Teshvikeli and as an urban sociology scholar. Admitting that ever more new demands for liberal democracy from the sub-local scale make the national government's stronghold become uninter I'm sorry, become interrupted, undermined, and weakened, weakened um, and gradually dispelled. Would a pro prolifer sorry for my reading. Would a proliferation of Teshvikis all across the country force Erdogan to backtrack or even resign? 
No, <laughs> one would wish. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, so, um, well, it's a good question. I re I really like the question, and it has several parts. So the first the first part is um, whether street level contestation. Oops, I lost the question now. It's, yeah, um, whether street level con um, contestation can constitute a gateway, not a barrier. Um, yes, I mean, my answer is definitely um, yes to that, because I'm trying to make this connection. Basically, what, what I'm trying to establish in this project is um, that in some countries, in, um, during very rapid political transition um, in the Middle East, um, there may not be a lot of venues, a lot of spaces to contest, to oppose the government. Um, because of the weakness of political institutions and because of the fragile, fragile nature of democratization, um, people don't find enough spaces to contest authoritarian regimes. And then this turns, of course, urban space to the last fortress of um, democratic contestation, which is harder to control for um, the government, especially if it's a large, complicated city like Istanbul. So my answer is yes. Um, not It's not a barrier. It, it's actually a propellant of democratization under circumstances. And now the second question is, is of course, more difficult to answer. Um, it's. Uh, whether or not uh, a proliferation of Turkey, uh, Peshwiki, um could force Erdogan to resign. Um, now, I'm very cautious to make a direct connection between um, urban contestation and um, what's happening at the top of the ladder uh, in the political society, particularly um, the ballot box elect elections in um, the president, which came to power by elections for the first time in Turkey. So uh, it's not perfunctory. In other words, I can't argue, and I don't think we can, none of us can argue that the more democratic contestation, the easier to control um, the elections and the consequences of the elections. Um, and I criticize political scientists for mainly and sometimes exclusively focusing on the electoral processes in the ballot box. Erdogan, I think, is unlikely to resign as long as he is elected to free and fair elections. Um, he may, he could, I can imagine uh, my political science um, uh, part, I mean, I also studied political science, my political scientists inside me can imagine how he can be forced to resign, but that, I think, has very little or nothing to do with urban contestation. The way I'm arguing um, about the link between urban contestation and democratization is a little less direct. Um, so no, you, Istanbulites who contest democratically are not going to force immediately anybody to resign. They can't change the results of the elect elections either. But I think they're doing something much more important than that. If you followed um, the Gezi protests, you may have noticed um, a city where I was born and raised and educated, uh, which always, which was always homophobic, turned into a very pro-LGBTQ um, uh, entity um, during the Gezi protests. This is huge. This happened with urban contestation. People started um, painting the city, the, the squares, the, the sidewalks, etc., in rainbow colors. This, I don't know how this happened, um, except for I traced these very small changes in the urban environment, how they were simmering, how, how they were slowly boiling and culminating. And I think they led to the Gezi protests. So this kind of democratization is what I'm talking about, um, not exactly the direct impact on making Erdogan resign tomorrow. I hope this answers your question, Oliver. OK, uh, now uh, if there is uh, Olivia, which uh, um, 
which uh, would like to um, say something, but he just answered to us. No, Giovanni, thanks. I'd rather let more people ask their questions and then uh, Mr. Turam answer it. Okay, uh, so we can give the floor to the next question. And uh, <coughs> and uh, we have also Azat Gundogan that now is going to pass uh, his question. I hope that they are not too long because uh, reading them can be a bit tiresome for the authors. So uh, this time, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Read for Berna. Berna, do you agree with that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. So we, we share a bit of the burden of this. Okay. Uh, and sorry also for my reading. I'm not a native speaker. I'm Italian, as you know, all know. Hello, Berna, and thanks for being here. I am an urban sociologist from Turkey. I have done my PhD research in a satellite city of Istanbul, named uh, Jeb Jebze. I did my ethnographic research in two working class neighborhoods that were targeted as the sites of urban renewal projects. I have two questions, and I apologize if they are too long. Sorry, Giovanni, I researched it in Istanbul. Smiley face. So, you conclude that uh, spatial contestations are symptoms of the failure of political institutions to protect privacy and secure freedom and rights. Page 427. Who would like to write more on the linkage between a failed institutional democracy and strict level findings? How do you feel the in between levels? I think uh, in the article I found the analytical linkages somewhat loose. Secondly, when I think of the marginal neighborhood, such as the GK uh, Condus, Squatter neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, rights and freedom have been radically defined by communities with political experience and memory, even more in line with what Lefebvre would call a cry for a right to the city, because of their sometimes not so quiet demand making. So, how do you define freedoms, liberties, and rights more concretely? In the article, they sound a little bit abstract. Smiley face, Michael. So, would we elaborate more on that? Um, yes, is it my turn yet? <laughs> yes, 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 it is. It's your turn now to answer to this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for these wonderful questions. Um, um, Azad, thank you. Um, very, very, um, very good questions that make me think. Um, so, for the, and the, again, there are several questions there. The first one, I think, um, is the the link, uh, analytical link between institutions, political institutions, not doing their job or displaying weaknesses, or what I call the weakening of democracy which happens in every democracy, by the way. Um, if you think about United States after 9-11, um, when it turned into a security state, um, we talk about, I talk about weakening of democracy. Um, so the link between um, the, this weakening of political institutions or instability of them um, and the urban contestation. Well, so my, I'm a sociologist. Um, I, conduct ethnography, um, and I would uh, um, categorize myself very comfortably in the subfield of state society interaction. And if you're familiar with Joel Migdal's work, um, this link between political institutions and the individual on the street is really not that um, uh, abstract or um, vague or um, hard to perceive because from where I look and the way I conduct ethnography is um, ethnography people interact with political institutions every day when I pay a traffic fine um, on the street I'm interacting with the police forces this is how I have concrete and spontaneous I view these interactions in all my ethnography on the street when I interview people, talk to them, and look at their practices, whether they're democratic or whether, whether they're beating up each other, um, 
I'm, I'm considering um, constantly the way they interact, touch, uh, challenge, question, or cooperate with political institutions. So I think one major problem for an ethnographer who studies the state is the way people perceive political institutions, particularly the state, as an abstract entity that is just so far away, um, or so like the Devlet Baba, meaning uh, the father state. Uh, it is so far above us, we can't even see any link between everyday life and uh, political institutions. The way I study the state, it is in the everyday life. And what Migdal actually originally said in 2000 in his book, State and Society, the, the state is embedded in um, in ev our everyday life. And this, the way I conducted this particular ethnography, the state is just embedded in urban space. Actually, I specifically focused on the government um, and part, partially the parliament um, overwhelmingly dominated by the Justice and Development Party. So um, I didn't spend too much time in defending this perspective because my work is so empirical. It makes it very, very obvious how people um, engage with the state, sometimes um, verbally by saying things, but most of the time in this book, particularly in this work, by acting, by changing their practices, by um, doing things horizontally to each other, like including the most pious Muslims, which is opening up um, uh, places that were closed to those um, citizens or residents before. So yeah, I mean, I, I did not try too hard to explain and defend this positioning. You may be right. I could have established it further. I think I may have taken it for granted because as an ethnographer, I see um, this as an obvious fact happening in everyday life. Your second question about freedoms and rights. Um, I may have spent more time in the book. I did spend more time in the book talking about what kind of specific freedoms and rights I was talking about. And when I was finishing the book, HPK was the first chapter in the first part of my research. When I was finishing the book, um, Gezi um, exploded, so it made things very, very obvious for the audience. Um, they, people kept asking um, questions about um, the importance of the city and urban space throughout my research, and then finally Gezi made it very clear to everybody, actually. So um, the young uh, protesters in Gezi came up and said directly and very in um, sheer in simplicity, they told the government, um, we want to be free. We don't need a father figure and mind your own business. Don't tell me how to live, what to eat, how to kiss or not kiss on the street. It was a, just a long list of don't tell me anything. So it was, um, Yezi made it very clear that freedoms and rights that people were asking for was just um, a simple demand of, I want to live my life the way I want to do, and I don't want a paternalistic figure, um, a president, prime minister, or a state telling me um, which lifestyle or ways of life lives are better, um, how I should talk and think, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of attire, freedom of um, sexuality, freedom of um, political choice, etc. So. Um, Teshvikia article reflects this entirely, but it may um, elaborate less on the freedoms and uh, um, about the nature of freedoms and light, rights. So I take this critique as um, um, uh, a very constructive one. I could have spent more time on it. Um, that's why. Thank you very much. That's great. In the meanwhile, I uploaded, as you see, the last, I think, uh, book by Bernaturam, Ukrainian Freedoms. You should uh, see the, the cover uh, there. Uh, as it, uh, it's answering, he's saying thanks. Could you follow on your information if they attended Jezi? And thanks a lot, Verna. I am looking forward to reading your book. So uh -huh. this is this is great. Now uh, we have uh, uh, the next question. It's by Rosa, and uh, I don't uh, dare uh, reading uh, her name. Um, but uh, she will tell herself, she can introduce herself, and after uh, she can uh, pose her question or her comment. Uh, please, Rosa, your microphone is open. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me. So my name is Rosa Chukalaiska, and I'm based at the City Institute at York University in Toronto. 
And I've got a question about methodology. Uh, my own work looks at contested neighborhoods in France. And in doing a lot of ethnographic work, it can sometimes be very difficult to decide how different actors relate to each other, how you situate yourself within that, and how to decide um, how to work with that material in sometimes tense situations. So I wonder if you could speak a bit more about how you did the ethnography, sort of the nuts and bolts of it, how you met your key informants, um, how you generated all the information that you had and decided what of that you would use in your article, and most of all, how you negotiated the contested part and the contested actors in the different conflicts within that particular space. I hope that makes sense. Rosa, could you please repeat your last question, the last sentence? I missed it. Oh, sorry. I just I said I hope that that question makes sense. It does. I just couldn't uh, write it down and missed the, the entire last question, last sentence. How I negotiated? How you negotiated the contested part of the neighborhood? Because, of course, there's different actors involved. There's different viewpoints. And it's I find very difficult to work within all the viewpoints and elaborate all the viewpoints. So how do you work? with that contested nature, that contested topic in an ethnographic research project in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I have to admit, I'm um, very impressed by um, all these questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so methodology. Um, and you said you're doing also uh, ethnography. Um, I, I don't know any other way through which, any other method through which I could actually do this kind of study. Um, really, ethnography to me is, was, was the key into this. Um, so how, how to decide and how to, how to decide in tense situations, how, how I met with the key informants? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, my, my previous book, my previous ethnography, um, was very keen on keeping an analytical distance from the subjects. I, in my first book, um, I studied um, urban sites of an Islamic movement, the Gulen movement. In this book, I kind of changed that attitude um, a little bit. Um, so I met my key informants, first of all, um, through urban sites that were very, very close to me. In other words, as I explained, I was born in Teshvike, raised in Teshvike. My extended family and many close friends were living there. So the key, some of the key informants I haven't even met. I mean, I, I've known them all my life, um, and I could trace them se um, decades back, um, which, of course, gave me, I mean, it was easy and difficult, which gave me difficulties, um, but also um, ease of access, I have to admit. And then later on, um, as the neighborhood changed, uh, and newcomers moved into the city. Obviously, I haven't known the newcomers for a long time. Um, I met three, four very important key informants who made me almost like have those aha moments in my interviews. And then I asked them to introduce me to their new friends in the neighborhood. And then I also keenly um, demanded that everybody I knew in Teshviki neighborhood to introduce me Every, uh, every newcomer that they meet. So it was like a collaboration. Nobody minded it, but it was my own familiar territory. Um, this was very different from my first book, where as a secular um, woman who was educated, um, who did a PhD in the West, was immensing herself into an Islamic movement. It took me years to gain their trust, whereas in Teshvikie, trust wasn't an issue uh, most of the time. Uh, even uh, even the um, uh, I call them in this article the um, uh, old, what is the word I use? The um, old timers. Um, even the old timers were not, I mean, the old timers who refused to open the doors of the neighborhood were not unfamiliar because they were my parents' generation. I knew them. Um, they knew me and they talked to me. Actually, even if I, sometimes when I had enough of talking to them, they talked to me in a strange way. So I had an advantage. The same thing in the book, I studied the campus, um, but I got my undergraduate degree there, and then I kept in touch with all the academics there. So I've known them for decades, and I know that political culture of the university because each time I go back, I spend a lot of time there, I give talks there, um, I organize conferences there. So in other words, Rosa, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I specifically chose intimate spaces 
that I've known for a long time, and they were these spaces were being um, transformed. They were changing rapidly. I wanted to catch that moment um, and write about, analyze and write about it. So access was not a challenge. The third site in the book is um, Berlin, um, Kurzberg. Obviously, I'm not a native to that site, and um, I, I, that that took some um, good effort. But um, again, I was at work in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, that immediately gets you into Kreuzberg, um, where the main language is Turkish. So um, I don't know if you have the same kind of um, advantages of access in France in the neighborhoods that you study. Now, with regard to your question about how to negotiate con contested parts of the neighborhood, because obviously, like every contested neighborhood, Teşvikiye and all the other sites that I studied are um, anything but monolithic. They're extremely heterogeneous. And they're not only heterogeneous, they're deeply divided by fault lines. And um, they, the people contest across these fault lines. So this is a very good question. How did I negotiate it? Well, it was, it was tough, I have to admit, because if I was a, an outsider, it could have been easier. Um, as, a, as, a, as an obvious insider, um, I got very tired. <laughs> I got emotionally tired because all these parts of my neighborhood or my campus, previous campus, that were dividing, um, was trying to almost like convince me, um, <laughs> pull me to their side. As if it matters which side I take because um, I'm not studying taking sides here. I'm trying to understand the divide and how it leads to democratization. So um, it was emotionally tiring. And um, if you could meet, I don't want to take more time, but if you could meet in a um, conference or something, I have so many anecdotes that I can share with you um, in which I got into, I got stuck in very, very difficult, um, emotionally challenging, but also analytically um, very difficult situations by people who've known me forever and um, who had a very hard time with me studying them. Family former professors, uh, former students. Um, and I've been yelled in a couple of conferences. I was told, don't study us. Um, it's, and I understand. Nobody studied me so far. It must be a hard, um, difficult situation. But when those people that you study are so close to you, um, and you have absolutely no analytical distance, like between you and your mother, it, it is emotionally very exhausting. But I have a lot of anecdotes I can share with you. Actually, we could do Skype after this session, or uh, if, if you would like to talk further. OK. Uh, thank you. And uh, now I, I would like uh, Kansu Civilek to have uh, his uh, intervention. And uh, I don't know, uh, Kansu, are you able to speak or would you like to, to write your question? I'm opening your microphone now, Kansu. Can you? No. Okay. Kansu is writing. This is not yes. good news for me, which <laughs> I can call. I can read it, Giovanni. Would you like to read it? Uh, if you can this time, uh, yes, thank you. Also, because I get a cold, so I cough a lot of time, and it's not nice <laughs> for you to hear me. No problem. Hi, Jansu. I'm reading um, your question. Thanks for being here today. My question follows the former question, so you can quickly explain my question with the concrete results of your ethnographic study. About the paper, you make the dichotomy between the ordinary people of Teshviki and the devout people and mention the contestation between them. Firstly, what makes these people ordinary? <laughs> and secondly, at the last part of your paper, you talk about the new generation or liberal people who respect the devout as well, which in fact was not the center of your paper when followed from the beginning. And in the paper, you, your general claim is how the contestation contributes to democratization. However, if you put these libosh people aside, there is not much evidence in the paper how the two oppositional groups, Teshvike people and the devout, um, 
contribute to individual freedom, new alliances, gateways, and democratic platforms. Because throughout the paper, you talk, you talk, you more talk about their ongoing contestation and anger. That's true. How exactly is the democratization happening in this picture? Um, if you could give examples from your ethnographic evidence. Thank you very much. So this this almost um, authorizes me to bring in some um, some of my stories. That's wonderful. So first of all, again, several questions here, and all of them are wonderful mm -hmm. and very, very bright. Um, why are these people ordinary? Um, I mean, I don't use this word as a um, um, derogatory term. Uh, I don't mean these people are, are ordinary in the sense that they have nothing interesting or striking. I re really use this as an analytical category to almost juxtapose it against, for example, political leaders or leaders of the movements, people who are um, paid so much attention to by social scientists. For example, um, let me explain an exam empirical example. When I studied the Gunan movement, um, I was asked, and my ethnographies are five, six years, I, I was always asked if I met Fethullah Gulen, the leader of the movement. Um, and I kept saying, no, I, pe I meet people with no names on the streets, the students, um, the, the grassroots of the movement. And for six years, I, had to, I, I was accountable why I refused to meet the political leaders of the movement. And um, some of them I met, it wasn't a refusal, but my um, aim was to just understand the mundane everyday life rather than the, the leading cadres. And finally, um, then the, the, the entire draft of the book was revised. I actually met with the leader, um, Fethullah Gülen. Um, that was a purposely late meeting, because I was studying ordinary people in the moment, not the people, the leaders who were supposed to be shaping it. Um, so your other question, let me remember it. Um, yeah. So. Um, you're asking if we leave um, those Libosh people aside, there is not much evidence in the paper um, about uh, what kind of democracies are, uh, democratic practices are emerging. Um, first of all, um, I, I have severe allergies to this word Libosh. Um, for those of you who are not from Turkey, um, I explain it in the paper, but so there, this is a very insulting term, and um, it basically makes fun of people who who define themselves as politically liberal. Uh, we are not talking about economic liberalism, neoliberalism here, politically liberal, like um, people who defend or prioritize freedoms over other political issues like justice and class equality, et cetera. And I know um, they all are important, but liberal people um, maybe can be compared to American political um, liberals, not neoliberals. And in Turkey, for um, a very long time, they've been made fun of. I think this kind of hit a wall when the Gezi protests exploded, and the young, progressive young people said, we want our freedom. We want to live free. Um, and they are middle class. Most of them were middle class. It was not a class-based leftist um, movement in general, or um, protest in general. So this word, Libosh, I don't I think um, Teshvike can be identified by them, or I don't think the people who made a change in Teshvike are Libosh. To the contrary, I think um, uh, during that period in Teshvike, um, people from different walks of life, uh, from different ethnic groups, different um, um, uh, class background, and different um, ages came together, unified, in actually developing some practices that made the neighborhood open up their doors. So they were mainly practices like, I think I give the example, traveling on the shuttles, Dolmush, um, the shuttles. So like the old guards in Teşvikiye, um, who are also representing a, a relatively more upper middle class um, background, would never use this dolmush and feel comfortable sitting next to a, a headscarf woman. And um, this rather heterogeneous new um, freedom seekers uh, had absolutely no issue doing that. To the contrary, actually, um, they 
most of them were creative class, like intellectuals, writers, students, I don't know, artists. Quite to the contrary, they actually say so in the article. They love seeing this mixing process in the neighborhood. They don't want the sterile um, Peshwiki anymore. Um, so, uh, I mean, I can give more examples, but they're not necessarily Libosh or um, the, the so-called um, empty head um, uh, liberals. But they are the people who want to live in a democracy uh, where democratic practices are um, uh, um, exercised. And uh, there are many qualities to these. There are many uh, layers of these practices. Uh, for example, inclusion is one of them. Um, sharing space, sharing power, sharing ideas is one of them. Um, I, I refuse to re uh, reduce this to tolerance because it's been it's a highly contested term. It's not only tolerance, but it is actually accepting other people's ways of life and living with them in the same territory, in the same environment, urban space. Um, so I don't see this as a very small link between a small Libosh group. First of all, these people don't self-define themselves as Libosh at all. Most of them, like me, have allergies towards this term. Um, and then the other group, devout, it's also a very heterogeneous group of um, people. Um, yes, they share a middle class um, orientation, but many people from lower class Islamic neighborhoods also came to Tashvike. They wouldn't be able to buy things, but they did. They do window shopping. So they're also very heterogeneous too. And the way they mix in without being disturbed or intimidated shows that um, also they, they don't represent a very um, polarized group of the devout people. Um, they're actually interested in um, melting and mixing in, becoming part of a um, heterogeneous uh, neighborhood that is in rapid transformation. So I don't know if this answers your question. If it's not enough, um, ask me more and I can give you more examples. Because I continued doing research after writing this article um, for a couple of more years as it was under revision. Thank you. OK, and um, I think that we can all thank a lot, Berna, for these uh, world insights. And uh, now we have, uh, I see that there are several hands which, has, which are on. So there is Basak, Linsai, Sarah, and Stefan. But uh, Sarah can talk, so I think we can uh, give the floor to Sarah. Uh, I'm just uh, recalling that uh, we will need to, to finish today in uh, <coughs> in 40 minutes, so um, we have still uh, uh, a lot of time. So I'm opening out the, the microphone uh, to Sarah so that she can uh, uh, add the, her contribution. Please, Sarah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Great. I'd like to thank you so much. This is a very rich case statement. Uh, and I think I'm going to keep my question fairly short, so I can condense it, since you've had many long questions. Now, uh, I'd like you to expand on perhaps how gender features within your argument and analysis a bit more. And this struck me as worthy of further consideration given the recurring image of like headscarved women in the paper, as well as quotes specifically concerned women's experiences and lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. um, so are you done? <laughs> yes, thanks. I thought I'd keep it. I, I promise to keep it short. Thank you. This is great. Um, so a couple of things. Um, is I mentioned it in the article, um, I do an intersection analysis and gender is um, just part of it with um, class, age, religion, religiosity, um, space. So there are too many components that intersect in this analysis. Um, but gender uh, stands out. I, I entirely agree with you because, um, because of headscarf and other forms of attire. Um, so throughout the entire ethnography, not just in Peshwiki, I continue gendering it. 
um, because it's mostly the woman at the center of uh, this explosive contest politics of contestation. Um, and it's partly due to the visibility of headscarf. Um, many other issues contested are not that visible. It, they're not to our face the way um, um, attire is. Um, second, in the, particularly in the Teshvikia chapter, um, we, we are talking about high spenders, women shopping, um, and spending a lot of time shopping. Um, there are very few men uh, who spend their entire day shopping and then sitting in um, expensive coffee shops for leisure. So yeah, I mean, the, um, the main figures, the main actors at the center of analysis are women. But that's not enough to gendering um, the analysis, of course. So um, when I followed um, Teshvikie, the, the findings of Teshvikie to other sites, the university campus and then to the immigrant neighborhood in uh, Berlin, um, I, was, I continued doing intersectional. And really, I mean, I didn't mean to emphasize or focus or put gender to the center, but it, it continued coming, um, uh, coming up as, as a very central um, layer of analysis or um, a lens of um, analysis. Uh, because if you allow me to give more anecdotes, um, for example, in the immigrant neighborhood, or let's call it diaspora space, um, the, um, the, the people who were at the center, again, of contestation, democratic contestation um, in Kreuzberg was most of the time the LGBT community. Um, I found it very interesting that we have very little um, lesbian visibility in Turkey and in Istanbul, very little lesbian visibility. And there are very few um, gay bars and coffee, coffee shops. But um, the lesbian places, urban spaces, um, to meet are almost hidden. They don't have names. They're open once in a night, once in a week, like Friday night only, something like nobody knows about them. They're like little cliques. To the contrary, Kreuzberg, the Turkish neighborhood of Berlin, is almost like the um, hub of LGBT life. And um, the clubs, the main clubs in Koti, the center of Kreuzberg, are actually opened and developed and made popular by lesbian Turkish immigrant women. Um, so again, I mean, automatically, um, you can see me as a slave of empirical data, but I didn't go there to find out that. I didn't study Teşvikiye. Um, to write something about headscarf the woman specifically. Um, whatever comes out, I remain very loyal to empirical analysis. Um, so politics of sexuality, LGBTI, became very central to um, ongoing contestations between very divided Turkish communities, like Alevis, with strong um, visibility in Kreuzberg, um, Islamists, Gülen movements, totally separate uh, from um, JD supporters in Kreuzberg, and then there's this um, LGBT community, and then there are nationalists, and then there are, there are Kurds, Kurds who are supportive of um, PKK and violence, Kurds who are not supportive of it. So all these divides were contesting a lot of issues, yet at the center, if you um, read that chapter, you will see, is this LGBT community, uh, community. and women, again. Um, very interesting. It just came out like that. It was unplanned, and I did not expect to find it at all um, in this way. But I think my lens for gender analysis allows me to notice these things. Um, does this answer your question, Dara? Yes, that's, I had a feeling that your response would draw on some of your other uh, case studies. And I was essentially most interested in yeah the kind of the centrality of women with this kind of process and struggle, particularly in some respects when the failure of formal politics is almost more pronounced for women. So thank you. You're welcome. And, and just not just women, if, if you notice the um, quite um, rude interaction between the headscarf woman um, in the, um, the department store where um, somebody, a man, yells at her, um, what are you doing in this? department store, did you lose your way or something? And she turns and says, I buy you and your friends, etc." There are gender dynamics where um, headscarf women are not supposed to behave that way. It's unexpected. It's shocking. 
um, what they do. So it is not just women, but it's also certain gender dynamics between other sexes and women. Um, yeah, it's it's not just the category of women, but um, power dynamics with other people between those women and other groups. Thank you. That's great. Uh, now we have uh, Basak uh, Tanurku, which uh, said to me that uh, can speak and write at the same time. So this is absolutely great. So that we can we have a double uh, uh, possibility of understanding uh, the question and uh, the comments. Please, Basak. Ah, you 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 already posted your question. Now you can speak, please. Who's speaking, Bashak or me? Well, I think that he was uh, somehow... Uh, he, he, I don't see him anymore among the voice participants. It means that probably uh, he had some technical uh, issue. And uh, no, we, we, uh, he's writing... We, we cannot hear you, uh, Basak. I'm sorry, uh, it's uh, probably some technical issue, but nevertheless, we can uh, we can read uh, uh, your, uh, your question. Go and, on, yes. uh, I'm happy to read it. Would you like me to go on? Uh, yes, please. Uh, okay. So, Bashak's question. As an independent scholar from Turkey who worked on the gated communities of Oops, now I lost the question because there's a new one. Can you repose? Um, Giovanni, I'm continuing to read it. Is that okay? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm very happy to read your paper. Oh, sorry. Um, is an independent scholar from Turkey? Or, uh, Ber Berna, can, can you speak? Are we able to speak now? Because Basak, uh, it's uh, it's on at the same time. Basak, please try to speak. Okay. No, Basak, we are not able to to hear Basak. So, Berna, please uh, go on. Thank you. Okay. As an independent scholar from Turkey who worked on the gated communities of Istanbul for my PhD research in Lanchester University. Um, I'm very happy to read your paper. About the tensions between secularists and Islamists in different groups, I also wrote papers, Turkish and English, on the tens tensions between the two sides, the native communities of Istanbul, northern part of Istanbul, experience similar tensions since they become the symbol of a secular lifestyle versus a more conservative um, sorry, I'm missing it when um, new sentences come. Um, versus more conservative locals and city governors. In addition, Islamists also have the tension among each other. Um, gated communities in Istanbul also indicate conflict among each other, since although secular, they are the symbols of different forms of capital, the old and the new, yes. Yes, I know that there are also gated communities of the Islamists and other non-Muslim communities. I have several comments and questions rela related to that. I also experienced similar tensions between the two sites, the last being in one of the summer resorts last summer, during which I tried to protect the Islamic side. Johnson's question is very good, since the two sides <laughs> do not go well. Instead, the elitist Teshvikieli moved out from the neighborhood, being replaced by the new liberal younger generations. The paper raises the issue such as there were only the Islamic and secular sites, while now there is more liberal public space where the liberal secular people go well with the Islamic middle classes. The paper does not mention the pressure coming from the Islamists to the secular people or people who do not look like a devout Muslim but looks like the other, like other, uh, like LGBT or a woman seen without honor in the context of Islam. Oops, um, not finished yet. Um, in addition, there is also tension 
I don't, I don't see the rest of that sentence. In addition, there is also tension and what? Um, and then there is other conversations coming here into the question. I don't see the rest of that question. In, after in addition, I don't see much. Um, would you like me to start responding to it? And um, I think that it's a good idea. Please begin to answer to this, and after we can uh, go on with the other questions. Because each time yes, so the person posts something, it scrolls up. So, okay. oh, so uh, there is another. Um, there is another huge paragraph. Just um, close at it, so you can read it if you want now. Okay. Do you want me to read it? As you feel, if you feel that uh, you'd like to answer to the first part of the question, do that. Otherwise, you can read it because Basat just posted it again, so uh, we have it there. Okay, let me um, let me read it because um, some of them may may be continuous questions. In addition, there is also tension between Islamists, at least it looks like, as the result of the emergence of anti-capitalist Muslims. A Turkish society gradually became convinced that the Turkish Islamists were not interested in overthrowing the secular. But this is quoting me. Quote: As Turkish society gradually became convinced that the Turkish Islamists were not interested in overthrowing the secular state and/or replacing it with the Islamic rule and law, the secularist fear of Islam shifted from the state level in the 1990s to the neighborhood level in the new millennium. Page 411. Unquote. This is a good analysis showing the shift from the state level to the neighborhood level. However, I'm not sure how people are convinced that the Islamists do not want to convert the Turkish society in, into an Islamic one. From the highest position of the government, there is a discourse aiming at creating a kindar and dindar youth, a religious youth who is full of hatred, or converting um, all primary schools into religious schools, lastly creating major debates in the media. Related to that, how do you see Gezi. How do you read Gezi? If everyone was happy with the government, how Gezi became possible in such a society? Um, first of all, there is no statement or um, in even like the slightest implication in this word that anybody is happy with the government. <laughs> I don't know where this is coming from. Um, second, um, again, we have all disciplinary um, differences in um, in terms of understanding concepts, but I believe an Islamic state, um, turning a state into an Islamist one is, is, is across the disciplines understood very clearly. So um, Turkey has for a long time um, been under this conspiracy threat that we were turning into Iran. And I understand as a sociologist why that this threat was um, scaring everyone in the 1990s. But um, after this party came to power for three times and has done a lot of harm to political institutions um, and has acquired a lot of power um, under Erdogan uh, and yet has not turned this state in a Sharia-based state, I'm not sure how um, anybody could argue that the goal of these Islamists are um, a Sharia state. Um, by increasing religious schools, uh, you, you don't turn, you don't, I mean, it's not a nice thing. I'm not defending it. Obviously, I would not do it if I was the president. Um, and I think it is, again, it is violating uh, freedoms and rights in many ways. But that we have to be rigorous in our definitions. That is not a Sharia state. United States is, has a lot of religious schools. It's a religious society. Again, I'm not defending it. I'm not judging it uh, either. But it's not a, a religious state. It, it's not ruled by um, uh, religious law. And um, actually, for example, Israel um, has some religious courts. Turkey does not. Institutions are still secular. Um, well, it may be a little bit provocative, Boshak, but um, I will comfortably argue, and I, we could argue later after the session too, that um, this government that we all criticize for authoritarianism and corruption and injustices is very little, has very little interest in debating Islam or Sharia or um, theology. I think they care more about power, money, uh, ways to corrupt the system than Islamizing it. Um, really, I mean, I could argue this in, from many perspectives, and I'm not going to take your time here. 
Um, but raising a kindar and dindar, um, religious and um, hateful youth, is not an indication or proof of a Sharia-based state or Islamic state. Um, again, countries like very religious countries like United States is also raising very religious youth. Um, and it doesn't turn United States into an Islam, um, into a religious state. Th these are confusing terminologies that um, need clarification because we are doing social science, not ideology here. Um, now, there are other questions. Um, Bashak, there are a couple of people who um, agreed with you in their questions that um, there is an explicit um, dichotomy between these two groups. I'm going to come to the end capitalist Muslims too. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so it, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because um, my findings and the main goal in writing this entire ethnography was actually to decenter that dichotomy and to show that the, this dichotomy between the so-called Islamists and secularists whether they're Kemalists or other seculars, is so out of date. So basically, empirically, I'm trying to show here that this axis of um, conflict between Islamists and secularists is being passé, and it's being replaced by this new axis of uh, being for democracy or being for authoritarianism. And I kind of display empirically throughout the book that both, both of these groups that you mentioned Islamists and secularists um, do consist of or comprise of uh, uh, Democrats and authoritarian people. So the axis is moving, and I've been arguing this very strongly in the book, but I believe it's also, it comes out clear in the article that this just juxtaposition of a staunchly secular against the so-called Islamists, I don't use that term anymore. I call these people pious Muslims. Um, is just not explaining the Turkish case anymore, really. Um, both the devout group and the seculars group have both Democrats in them who challenge JD, Justice and Development Party, and Erdogan, and who support. Um, so these categories are not helpful in social science anymore. I think we're still stuck in these categories because of our personal ideological standpoints in politics, but that has to be separated um, from our academic and there was, this is this is my take. Now, um, anti-capitalist Muslims. So there is no problem. I'm reading um, her quest last question. So there is no problem to want to raise a youth full of hatred, even it does mean it does not mean Sharia. It's good to. Um, so thanks for asking me this. Um, again, like your comment about um, the government. Um, Everybody's happy about the government. Nobody's arguing it. First of all, I think good social scientists um, don't say this is good, this is bad. These are ethical. I mean, if you're in ethics department, that's a different issue. But my job as a sociologist is not to show what is good, what is bad, and instruct people about that. I analyze. Um, I may have some biases, like gender biases. I'm, I'm a feminist myself. Um, but. Um, of course, raising a youth full of hatred or actually inflicting hatred, fear, anxiety into the society is a bad thing. But th is this a sociological argument? Like, isn't that obvious? And I don't believe um, by doing this analysis um, in telling that the axis has moved, any of us um, are implying that hateful youth is a good thing. I don't know where these arguments are coming from, to be honest with you. It's a little bit um, confusing for me. Um, so the question about anti-capitalist Muslims, I have to remember it because you had many, many questions. I have to find it. Um, and if, if it's handy, you can remind me of the question about the anti-capitalist Muslims. I can't find that question, Boshak. Well, I, I think that uh, we have the last minute, so it's better we we go on with uh, with the other questions. Uh, if you agree, Bernard. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, you did. Just... Okay. Because there are also other people that would like to interact. For instance, Federica Duga, I think that she's able to speak. Federica, can uh, can you speak? Can you say anything? Hello, Federica? Yes, Federica, if you speak, we will hear you. Okay, if you don't speak, so uh, we don't hear you. Okay, so let's go on with the question by Laura uh, Wentz. Uh, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, uh, Laura uh, is going to write. Um, okay, please, Laura, you can uh, write your uh, your question. Okay. Laura, can you hear? <laughs> we, we can listen to music from Laura's computer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do, would you like me to read this? Do you want me to? Read um, I, I can do it. So you can rest a little bit, Berna. What do you <laughs> okay. think? Thank you. Uh, so Laura, thanks, Giovanni. Dear Berna, I'm sorry I missed your introduction. Uh, so I'm I'm muting Yuri. Otherwise, you make noise. Um, I'm sorry I missed your introduction. Um, could uh, kick myself, rather South African National Energy Service, because I read your paper, um, my great pleasure. It's such a rich description, and contrary to what's up, I appreciate the nuance. So I apologize in advance if you have already touched uh, this aspect I wanted to raise. Could you elaborate a little more on where exactly the high spending the new population comes from because you described in the beginning that historic, historically the Devu were seen as some from the slum. So my question is where are the Devu high spenders coming from? Are the slum becoming more and more middle class? Or are they coming from the new built satellite town? And secondly, a very benign question. Why are they coming back in spite of the contestation they experience? Is it really just because the shops are so nice uh, that similar could not be found in more debut areas? And thirdly, a very short question, just out of curiosity. What makes a Euro Cafe and how do you, do you define one? <laughs> Thank you. Very nice, very, thank you. Um, wonderful questions. <laughs> um, okay, so um, where do these people come from? Um, so, in Istanbul, I mean, I, I'd say in the article that Istanbul was divided between, when it was divided deeply in 1990s, um, that um, the parts associated with the so-called Islamists were um, kind of lower socioeconomic status, including um, uh, slums. And then the other parts were considered as um, the property or territory monopoly of the secularists. Um, that changed. I, I make that argument that in the new millennium, um, mixing started in certain places. So, but you're saying, this is a very good question, which needs to be incorporated to the analysis. So if it was mixed, if, if, if it was divided and it's mixed now, where are these people coming from? Because, specifically because, these high spenders have not become uh, the local residents of Teshvikia. They don't live there. Although there are a couple of um, exceptions to that, um, like famous artists and uh, so on, writers. Um, there are one or, few, one or two very few Islamists who are residing there. So where are they coming from? So um, in the, here you see the formations of Teşvikiye only, but the city of Istanbul and all the major cities of Turkey are also in transformation because if you noticed, um, there is a transformation of the political elite. So this country has been ruled by the um, secularist elite, secularist and westernist, um, westernized elite uh, up until late 1990s and 2000, actually really the new millennium, 2002, when the Justice and Development Party came to power. So you're talking about the replacement of this old secularist elite by the new pious Muslim elite, 
which has become increasingly uh, powerful, both economically and politically. So their political power was accompanied with um, acquisition of more money. And also, of course, education, better education, um, and they were up in the socioeconomic ladder. Um, so they're coming from other rich neighborhoods, some of them, uh, some of which are actually in formation, in, like in being formed, new. Um, like, for example, there is this Boshak Shehir, um, which just emerged literally um, as a gated community, gated suburb. Um, Ayşe Çavdar, who wrote her dissertation on this topic and hasn't published it yet, calls it a suburban ghetto because it's an Islamist neighborhood that just emerged. Um, it's uh, relatively well off compared to many other Islamist neighborhoods that we know of. First of all, it's a gated community. Um, and I haven't conducted research there yet, but I will definitely look into it. There are arguments that even some of the rich political, pious Muslim uh, politicians um, make sure that their mistresses, illegal relationships, um, partners live in this gated community, etc. So they're coming from places like that, but also um, some of the older neighborhoods, which were kind of more conservative, but not identified as Islamists um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, they were considered like, you know, highest conservatives, like Üsküdar, for example, um, which sees, uh, which has beautiful views of uh, Bosporus Channel, um, has also attracted a lot of rich, um, pious Muslim residents. So, um, what I'm trying to say is they don't move into neighborhoods like Tefikia, which open their doors. They go and shop there. They go hang out there. Uh, they socialize there. Um, but they, they come from other neighborhoods um, that tend to be either entirely segregated for the rich, nouveau rich, a pious Muslim, or um, they are mixed with other conservative residents. Um, like, for example, in Üsküdar, um, the political culture of the neighborhood is conservative. Not everybody is an Islamist or pious Muslim. Uh, but for example, I also studied calligraphers, the, the artists of um, Islamic um, art of writing. They love living in Üsküdar because although they're not quote by quote um, Islamists, um, they, their art is about writing Quran. So most of them are believers. They're internationally famous um, artists who are believers and who, who do Islamic arts. They, they love to live in um, Üsküdar, in beautiful um, condos that see Bosporus Channel. Um, it, it's, it's, it looks quite luxurious, but the neighborhoods um, that I'm talking about right now have also a very um, conservative stigma to them. So they're coming from those places. Um, just to add to this, so the the rich, um, the, the rich of the rich uh, from the old secularist um, groups of Turkey, uh, whether they're political elite or economic elite, they, some of them, for example, would own um, houses on Bosporus, um, houses that are like 10 million plus um, dollar worth of. So the new Islamist elite or the pious Muslim elite has not acquired that kind of thing yet. And if you look at the top 10 or top 20 richest um, uh, people, families of Turkey, uh, very, very few of them are pious Muslims. So this should tell you that the, the creme de la creme of the country, if we really rank like the top layer, is still not Islamist, with a couple of exceptions, exceptional families. Does that answer your question? Okay, Laura said so that's great. We have the, the last two questions because it's uh, Italian time, uh, 5 21 p.m. So, um, oh, Laura is asking you about the Euro Cafe, about the definition how do you define an Euro Cafe? I love that. It's, it made me laugh because, to be honest with you, it's quite an analytical exercise to. Um, do a thick description to describe it now. Well, you have to go to Teshuki to see them, I guess. So, what is a Euro Cafe? First of all, um, there's a, I have to admit, um, I use it almost sarcastically to imply a pretentious 
side of it, of these cafes, coffee shops, they're extremely expensive. Um, what they serve has almost nothing to do with um, what you consider like any traditional Turkish food. Um, so you would, I mean, one of them even has a French tartare. Um, that is like a fortune to afford. And some people go there just to specifically eat that French, French tartare uh, and pay an enormous amount of money because they can only get it there in that particular place. There are a couple of other places too, but um, so there is a certain sense of pretension um, uh, because it serves um, that kind of food you can't find anywhere in Istanbul. Or um, these are, um, I mean, sometimes we joke and call these places no trash because people go to these places not because they have delicious food, but just to show up, like to show their faces. Because um, sometimes a regular a filter coffee costs you like $7, or a lemonade costs you $10. People just go um, pay that much of money to be part of that crowd, to show their face, um, and, you know, European in Istanbul, the, the label European in Istanbul is kind of a popular, cool thing. It's fashionable. It's France. It's Italy. It's this and that. Italian coffee, French food. Um, so I wouldn't describe um, a coffee shop in Europe as such because it's a European coffee shop in Europe. But when um, you move those kind of pretentious things to the Istanbul context, it becomes mainly about showing off. And um, I mean, I didn't say it. I didn't want to use this in this um, um, sarcastic way. But now that you asked me the question, and I'm um, questioning myself in a very honest way, there is this sarcastic uh, meaning attached to the term Euro Cafe, at least the way I use it. And um, just to add, um, despite the fact that alcohol is served in all of these places, whether it's a coffee shop, restaurant, bar, whatever, uh, we see headscarved Muslim women uh, sitting down, hanging out, uh, taking a break from shopping in these places. So they're, they're really mixing in. Um, I have been part of feminist movements and groups for a long time in Istanbul, and this has always been a problem. Where to meet? If you're meeting um, as an inclusive, all-inclusive feminist group that wants to overcome the boundaries between secularist and Islamist women. Um, this was always a problem, whether the place served alcohol or not. In, in Teşvikiye now you see, not too many, but um, some pious Muslim women hanging out in these Euro cafes and playing this game of showing up there, showing their faces there, um, you know, and you're spending a lot of money uh, for these kind of products. Okay, Berna, we have uh, two other questions <coughs> by Federica and Lindsay. And uh, I would just uh, urge you to uh, be a bit shorter in your answer because we have just five minutes uh, before the other session uh, begin. So we'll, we will need to, to be uh, quicker. So, uh, Federica, can you post your uh, question? I know that you cannot speak, so if you can... Uh, uh, write your question down, we uh, we will uh, read it. Okay. Okay, I'm reading the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Quote, spatial um, contestations are symptomatic of the failure of political institutions to protect and secure freedoms and rights, unquote, page 427. Are they not always the case? Or should we not aim to have spatial, spatial contestation even when freedom and rights are secured? Um, this leads me to the comment, have the ideas of freedoms and rights become apolitical and non-ideological and uncontested in their meaning? Of course, it's important that everyone can express themselves, um, that we have freedom of cult and so on. They do have political engagement of any kind out of institutions, but I'm interested to know what kind of interaction stems out of the neighborhood. From the article, I take that it is a very natural one, but it is something that residents are aware of. Do they see themselves as agents of transformation? Can we call it progressive societal transformation or just one led by other structures 
even if indirectly, for instance, change in the real estate market patterns. Linked to this, how has the layout of the neighborhood changed, the new buildings, new coffee shops, libraries, et cetera? And how do you think it has affected this form of contestation, contested conviviality? Uh, are these spaces in which there is a sort of implicit regulation, self-regulation or by some institutions, as more acceptance of the other is fostered. Finally, I'm also an ethnographer. Thanks for such a strong ethnographic um, theoretical piece. Well, thank you so much, Frederick. Frederick, am I saying this correct? I don't see your name um, in writing. Frederica. Oh, OK, perfect. I'm so happy that I asked. Um, Frederica. Um, OK. Um, there are so many questions. I don't know where to start. I think I will. I may have to be selective. Otherwise, um, I may have to talk for another hour or something. So the question about spatial contestation, um, it's a very good question. Like, um, do we use, do we, do we adopt or practice spatial contestation in the city um, only when? Um, our freedoms and rights are attacked? It's a very good question. And then the second one related to it is, um, so then um, is this a, an in, almost inherently non-ideological or um, apolitical contestation? Now, these are challenging questions. Um, I would not push this argument to say we need spatial contestation only when freedoms and rights are not secured or attacked. Um, but this book is written at a certain time in historical in in, peer, in history <laughs> um, when we see urban contestation endemic across the globe. I mean, do I need to mention them? Occupy um, in the United States, Arab Spring in um, in the Middle East, Yemen in Turkey, and then millions of other occupies in England, um, Spain, etc. So people are contesting. Uh, most of these examples I'm giving are protests. People are standing up for something. Um, and I'm not going to argue it's globally the same um, cause. Because, for example, as you all know, Occupy in the US was m much more concerned about socioeconomic injustices, inequalities, because the US is such a, an, an aggressive form of capitalism and inequality. In Turkey, I, I read the Gezi more as a uh, and people standing up for their rights and freedoms to live free, the w freedom of ways of life because of Erdogan's increasing authoritarianism. Um, and yet, we see many other forms of these protests across the world. Like in London, I think um, the students protested the increasing fees of tuition fees of universities, etc. So, and most of these examples I'm giving, except for the Arab Spring are in um, the so-called democracies of different sorts, right? I mean, England, United States, many Latin American states are considered as this, this form or that form of democracy, Turkey included. So that's why I'm kind of almost implicitly saying, yeah, people go to the streets um, when um, formal institutional um, base of democracy proves either weak or um, incomplete or insufficient. So I mentioned the US went to a weakening period of democracy. Um, I see that, I mean, I can expand this analysis. In Europe, I think many democracies uh, are challenged by um, the rise of um, nationalist right wing. I mean, I may even just take the liberty of saying some rise of fascism against immigrants and Islamophobia. Etc. I mean, and then economic crisis in the south, southern um, parts of Europe. So people are standing up because something happens because institutions, the institutions of democracy, are just not enough, or they are not representing the discriminated or repressed minorities. It could be the poor, it could be the migrant immigrants, it could be the um, it used to be the Muslims in Turkey. It's no longer the case. I think the um, their victimization ended. Far um, it ended by far. Um, we may talk about the victimization of other groups now, like the 
um, religious minorities in Turkey and ethnic minorities in Turkey. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to tell you this book, this, this ethnography is written within the zeitgeist. This is happening um, across the globe as we are talking. I didn't specifically look at the prote abrupt protests. I just wanted to see um, what's happening in the mundane everyday life when people don't protest but live in contested places. Um, but it, it, it is part of the same picture where people are people um, grievances are not represented in the government because the government is, is either too authoritarian or too capi aggressively capitalist or um, unfair or like in the German case it's a strong democracy very strong democracy with strong institutions but um, there is not enough contestation about how to integrate Muslim immigrants the Turks there's not enough contestation, debate, disagreement in the parliament. At least during the time I studied this, um, that this was the time of Merkel uh, before Grand Coalition. Um, there was not con there's n there was not much contestation in the parliament, um, so people took it to the neighborhood level, and that was their only fortress to fight for it. So I hope this answers the question. If not, we can talk about this further because I think this is a very important question. Um, now you have many of this non-ideology, uncontested. Um, yeah, this, this I have to think about this question further because I clearly argue that um, what is happening here is to take the, free, the, the, the contestation over freedoms and rights above the ideological level. So. Um, um, this, this is a very good question. It, does it always have to be like that? Of course not. There is no such, such um, scientific analysis which says it has to free, the defense of freedoms and rights have to be non-ideological. Yeah, no, that, that's not true. Even feminism is ideological, and um, there could be a feminist defense of freedoms and rights. But um, because this is an ethnography, I'm actually um, finding it, it's one of my findings that. Um, the trend led by the middle class in all these ur contested urban sites was um, non-ideological because the divides are ideological and identitarian. In other words, I study sites that are divided by leftism, nationalism, fascism, um, staunch secularism, Islamism. Both Kreuzberg and Teshvike and the university are divided as such. But I'm saying what comes as an alliance out of this deep ideological divides is, is a non-ideological uni unified group that cares about freedoms more than ideology. But this is more like an empirical finding in um, analysis rather than um, trying to create a general rule that freedoms, defense of freedoms are non-ideological. Um, I hope I make sense, but I will keep thinking about this question and I like the question for further theoretical and conceptual thinking. Um, anyway, uh, Berna, with uh, one forum uh, which is open in the same platform, after if you want, they can uh, send to you the precise address by email, in which you keep discussing. There are already four uh, issues for discussion which has been opened by our participants, and this is uh, a place in which uh, we could continue, uh, continue discussing. So I think we can uh, use that. Thank you. Uh, also in the following weeks. And um, out of time, um, there is Linsai, which says that uh, uh, most, of the, uh, most of her questions were somehow already given by, by Federica. So I think that I can uh, uh, I interpret what everybody thinks. Thank you a lot for this really interesting, uh, uh, well, it was not a lecture, but it was really interesting intervention uh, you had and very good article you had. Many, Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, many good wishes for your book. Uh, it sounds promising. I'm going to buy it uh, as soon as you can. Uh, as I can, and uh, you have a nice evening, and uh, <coughs> thanks again, and bye-bye, then. Well, thank you so much, uh, everybody. These were amazing questions, very good um, critical stances. 
I would love to keep in touch with you. So um, if, if you have time, if you're interested, pre please email me. And um, could you please put to the title the IGER discussion or yeah, IGER discussion, so that I actually prioritize because I get 200 emails a day. I would love to, love to keep in touch. And Giovanni, thank you so much for inviting me. This was um, very, very precious. I really appreciate this. For us too. Now, uh, <coughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, Does, we can Does everybody have my email? Should I write it? I'll just put it here. Uh, we, we keep in touch by the forum. Uh, so I think we can uh, do it there. Don't worry. Okay. But okay. you just gave it to everybody, so everybody can uh, can uh, now can uh, write uh, directly to you. Okay. okay great. So Very much. good night or good day to everybody. As as you know, you are in different places of the world. So for some of you, the day is just beginning. For me, it's just finishing my working day. So good. See you next time. Next time is not uh, on day 11, March 11, but it's going to be on March 18 for the next session, which uh, is going to be the origin of urban crisis, the restructuring of San Francisco Bay Area and the geography of foreclosure by Alex Shafran. Okay, so I'm disconnected and uh, good night again.